Jon Snow's report may not have done away with the miasma theory of disease, that would be left to Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch, but it did surprisingly give contagionists and anti-contagionists one thing that they could agree on. Filth was bad. Whether you believed that fetid stenches from the cesspits caused the Broad Street outbreak, or whether you believed that contamination from those cesspits seeping into the water table were at its root, this sort of unregulated disposal of waste into streets, basements, and backyards was a problem. And so, Snow's report gave further credence to a growing movement, a movement that played a huge part in defining and creating the modern world. But it's a movement rarely discussed, so today we're going to talk about the sanitary movement. Now remember that everything we talked about with Jon Snow, everything we discussed with the Broad Street outbreak, happened in 1854. That's little more than 150 years ago, and yet to us today, it's unimaginable that you would let sewage just flow freely through the streets or pump filth into your drinking water. So how did that change occur? How, in just a century and a half, did we get from sewage-ridden cities to where we are today? Well, in my opinion, the impetus for the change was simple. This may sound mind-blowing, but until the 19th century, cities were demographically negative. More people died than were born in cities. They were only kept afloat due to a constant influx of people migrating in. And it makes sense. Squalid living conditions, tight-packed populations, and poor nutrition in a pre-refrigeration, pre-mass shipping world? These places were rife with disease. And for most of mankind's history, this wasn't a huge concern, as the vast majority of the population needed to be working the land just to produce the food society needed. But the Industrial Revolution changed all that. Improved farming techniques meant that fewer people had to be working the land, and the growth of finished goods economies, massive manufacturing economies, meant that people were needed in the cities to work the factories, and that meant that cities had to grow. You just can't have the complex, interconnected chains of production that define our world today unless you have great concentration of population and massive urban centers. This meant that we as a species had to rethink how we did cities. And the path to this began with a guy named Edwin Chadwick. In 1842, he released a report that basically said, Look, guys, there's poop in the street. We gotta do something about the poop in the street. And surprisingly, this turned out to be a major catalyst for something actually being done about it. Now, there's a lot of debate over whether things started to get done because people actually cared about the plight of the poor, or if they were afraid of a popular uprising if conditions didn't get a little better, or if they actually just thought that more sanitary conditions meant fewer sick poor people, which meant that this was a way to make the poor cost the government less money. But no matter what the cause, things started to get done. And in fact, the creation of local boards of health, like the very group that Jon Snow presented his findings to to get the pump handle in Broad Street removed, were a direct result of some of the legislation precipitated by Chadwick's report. But in addition to forming local boards of health, this idea of creating sanitary cities went much further. They introduced sewers, real sewers, the kind we think of today. In fact, many of our major sewer systems today are the systems they built during this time. Although Jon Snow wouldn't live to see it, the London sewer system which his work helped to inspire, built in 1859, is still what our giant modern city of London uses today. And you know what? That horrible specter, that demon cholera that Jon Snow spent his entire life fighting? The sewer system vanquished it. London would see only one more cholera epidemic after the Broad Street outbreak that Jon Snow so valiantly tried to contain. And this final outbreak happened in the one part of London where the sewer system hadn't yet been completed. Luckily, this last epidemic was quickly attacked by a man named William Farr, the very same man who Jon Snow would so often pester at the Registrar General's office for statistics. He had learned from Snow and believed his theory, and he used Snow's methods to limit the outbreak of cholera in 1866. After that epidemic, cholera in London would be no more. And this may sound like a simple thing. I mean, we rarely ever think about the sewers flowing under our feet. But these sanitation projects were some of the greatest public works projects ever attempted. Monuments like the Eiffel Tower or Mount Rushmore pale in comparison to what needed to be done here. Imagine taking the city you live in and having to rip up every street, tunnel under every house, and connect every building with a massive network of pipes and waterways. Imagine the disruption this would cause. Imagine the expense. I'm honestly not sure we would be bold enough to take on such projects today. The London system alone had to run 13,000 miles of pipe to see this project completed. That's roughly half the circumference of the Earth. They laid 318 million bricks and dug out 2.7 million cubic meters of dirt from the streets of London just to put this sewer system in. In Europe, major parts of cities were sometimes simply torn down and rebuilt whole cloth around more sanitary lines. In Chicago, they literally lifted the city up by four feet and put the sewer system underneath it. 
But in the end, these massive efforts had an effect. Not only was cholera defeated, but things like typhoid and typhus were massively reduced, paving the way for the giant economic engines that we think of as today's cities. It's largely unsung, rarely given pages in history books or called out in classes, but the sanitary movement is one of the bedrocks of modern civilization, one of the stepping stones to the world we understand today. It has had a profound effect on humanity and saved countless lives. It is up there with antibiotics and vaccines for the number of human deaths it's prevented. So today, we just wanted to look at this one piece of Jon Snow's legacy. He may only have been a tiny part of it, but it's a part I think he'd be proud of. And although he's better known as the father of epidemiology, and his contributions there were absolutely enormous, I think that he would want us to take a moment to look at and to remember a part of medical history that's so important but so often glossed over because it's unglamorous. So, unlike those who turned a blind eye to Snow's own discoveries because they found them unpleasant to think about, let's celebrate sanitation and all that it's done for us. Here's to you, Jon Snow. <laughs>